I'm live. Coolio. All right. Um, if you just joined, uh, if you're not watching this live, if you're just watching the video, I'm going to start at 3.05. It's currently 3.01. So do the math on that. I'll also put a timestamp in the description. Okay, I got to Oh, we have a viewer. <laughs> if I know who you are, please say something in the chat or text me or something like that. I know my, like I said, I know my thumbnail game is, is just terrible. Oh, yeah, and um, we'll start at 3.05 if you're wondering. Um. Okay, is this, I know my, the Wi-Fi in my room is terrible and like my camera is also terrible. So I know you can only see like two pixels at two frames per second, but I will do my best to write big and say what I'm doing. So hopefully uh, you're able to follow kind of what's going on. Yeah, my setup is real janky. Yeah, I'm using a, a music stand that doesn't like to stay up. Two viewers. Oh my God, this is crazy. Oh, <laughs> they lag. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else to cover. Try and see if lighting is better if I do that. Um, I think it's fine like that. I think that's fine. Yeah, so I'll probably do, I'll probably solve like the AMC 10 or something like that just for fun um, when it comes out in a couple weeks because the Putnam is in one month. So I need, you know, I need to like, I'm going to be going hard. So like I need to take a break at some point to do something like the AMC 10. Uh, but I feel like it could be an embarrassing experience if like I get really stuck on something. So we'll see how that goes, but I'm optimistic. Um, what time is it now? You then? Yes, mom. <laughs> I'm tutoring someone right now. Oh. Yeah. Okay, you didn't give Amber a bath, did you? I'm gonna uh, later. I can do it. No, it's fine. I got it. Absolutely ridiculous. Okay, it's through five, so I'm gonna get started, even though there's only one person. Um, because it's, it's other people's fault if they're late. All right, so I will be presenting the solutions to 2017 A1 and B3. Now I know A1 and B3, it seems like a weird combination, but personally I felt like both the problems were, I mean, obviously A1 is gonna be kind of relatively easy and B3 I felt like I got through pretty, I don't, I don't wanna say easy, right? Cause that's relative, but got through pretty well. Um, I noticed in the past I was often pretty slow to the point. I, I like to be thorough and I'll still try to be thorough, but I'll try to be more to the point. However, it's important to realize that it's part of the problem solving process to kind of, you know, um, go the wrong direction. And, you know, when you solve a problem, the solution is to the point, but your solving process is not actually to the point. So that's important to keep in mind. So let's get into it. 
and that was 2017 A1. You can probably look this up. Um, I put the problem in a post, but you can just look up 2017 put on problems and find this. The problem, I don't actually have it on my phone. I'm just kind of remembering. You basically have the set S and it has, the, it has the property that two is an S. If N squared is an S, then N is an S. And if N is an S, then N plus five squared is an S. And so um, you want to find the small, you want to find the, the elements or, you know, whatever elements are not in S. Okay. Now, before we begin, um, first we want to have like some kind of guiding questions or ideas that we want to use to, to guide our process. Now, at least first looking at this problem, S is kind of like a black, it kind of seems like a black box. Like it, it seems kind of like a weird kind of contrived situation. So it's important that we have some kind of direction uh, in order to figure out what's going on or else we're just gonna be lost the whole time. Now first, it has to do with structure. So it has to do with, you know, what does S look like? And how do the conditions of the problem behave to create S? So I'll write that down. The first has to do with kind of the given information. Oh yeah, and this, you know, I'm gonna be writing in blue probably the whole time because my black markers are dying. And my handwriting is, yeah, my handwriting sucks, but what does S look like? Now the second question has to do with the condition. So why would, you know, like you have to think about the problem, like, like it's not just some random thing, right? It's like, there's, uh, the, you know, the kind of given the condition, you kind of have to ask yourself like, why would particular elements not be an S, right? Like what, what is special about that? Clearly there's something interesting going on there or else it wouldn't be a button problem. So the second question has to do with the condition. Why would particular, oh shoot, elements not be in S? And lastly, this isn't really a question, but it's something important to notice, which is that this is an A1. I mean, it's still a hard problem, okay, it's a pun problem but there is a straightforward solution or some kind of key insight, which is really gonna wrap things up nicely. Cause we have to remember is that like, just the very fact that people are able to solve like almost all of the problems on the Putnam. If you, if you solve all six in three hours, that's like 30 minutes per problem. So there are people who are able to solve this problem and write it up in like 15 minutes, which means that the solution is not gonna be like five pages. And if we have five pages of work, we're probably going down a, uh, a route, which is not correct. So that's just important to keep in the back of our mind because um, it's easy to kind of get lost thinking that, you know, just bashing it through is, is the way to go. It's not. Um, so I'll write that down. So notice there exists a sort of like a couple or one um, key insights. So there exists a key insight which really wraps everything up nicely. And pretty much, you know, in any problem you're given, you're going to have these same three kind of guiding questions in one way or another. The first question has to do with the given information. So how does like working forwards, the second, um, you know, how can you use the given information to figure out what it's telling you? The second question has to do with the condition and working backwards. Like what does the condition necessarily imply about the given information? And the third is just an important reminder that, you know, an important reminder that um, there is probably a key insight or a couple key insights which can really wrap things up and that you shouldn't just, you shouldn't just focus on bashing everything through. You have to be, you know, it's an just important thing to keep in the back of your mind. Now, first we're gonna attempt the first question, which is working forwards. So we're gonna start with the given information and we're gonna follow it down and see what, you know, see where it brings us. Now what we have, I'll show my work, my review work for this. I will say the first time I solved this problem, it was a couple months ago and I actually couldn't solve it because I was just trying to bash it through and that was not the way to go. 
granted, I think now I would be able to solve it if I had seen it cleanly because I practice a lot, but um, I, I will discuss that more later. So, so what we have is two is an S, N squared in S implies N is an S and N being an S implies N plus five squared is an S. So two is like a starting seed and these two operations kind of allow us to generate new elements of the set. Now, again, like I said, this, it seems kind of contrived and it kind of is, but we want to get a general kind of intuition for what's going on here. So two is like the starting seed, right? And we can think of n squared to n as kind of like a shrinking operation, right? Um, this last operation seems easier to use because you just have an element and then you just can make a new one. Uh, this one is is a bit is a bit weirder, right? But like we can distinguish the two by this one shrinks elements, this one expands elements. And this is an expansion. Cool. Okay, so now, now we're going to do a classic thing. We're just going to test cases, right? We're just going to generate elements of S and see what happens. I'm going to turn on the light because it's pretty dark. So we're going to test cases. Of course, when you test cases, like I said, you need to be careful because a common problem when you're testing cases is that you're just testing cases. You're testing cases with no direction whatsoever. You don't really know like what you're actually looking for. And often you can get kind of bogged down in just testing cases, testing cases that you don't kind of take a step back and test them in a smarter way. If that makes sense. Sort of look, you know, look at the big picture again. So first we start with two. Oh, I guess I, I erased the operations. Um, I will write those back, but not with the comments. I'll just write them kind of small up here. So first we start with two. And clearly the only thing we can do is this. Right, n to n plus five squared. So we know that two plus five or seven squared or 49 is in S. So, you know, we know that seven squared is in S. And I'm, I'm leaving it as seven squared because then we can notice like, well, if seven squared is in S, then what, what can we do with that? Well, we can take the square root, right? So seven is then in S. And like quickly, and I'm writing these in a particular spot. I mean, quickly, you should be able to notice that, well, if seven is in S, then so is 12 squared, and then so is 12. And when you notice that we actually have every number two mod five in S, and that comes from a very basic sequence of operations, which is if N is in S, then so is N plus five squared, and thus so is N plus five. And this is really important, right? Because this is like, a, this is a very nice kind of like linear creation of elements, um, and it's not as contrived. So what we notice is that, okay, well, all we really need to do is figure out what are the small, for each value mod five, what are the smallest numbers which appear in S? Uh, because if like, let's say 11 appears in S, then so does 16, 21, 26, et cetera. Um, so we kind of need to analyze each, each mod five. We already know that for two mod, we already have two mod five, okay? Like every number two mod five is in S. So that's already completed for us. Um, so like, for example, so what we could do is, you know, so what I did was I, I kind of made a list like zero mod five, uh, one mod five, two mod five, three and four. So I already know like, so, and here I'm gonna list the smallest elements mod five, which are here. So two, we already know, two mod five, we already know is two. Zero mod five, if we just go down, what we notice is that like none of these, if two is not a multiple of five and neither of these operations are going to produce a multiple of five, right? Like if some number squared is not divisible by five, then if like n squared is not divisible by five, by five then n won't be divisible by five. And the same is true here because we're just adding five and squaring. So for zero mod five, we know that no multiples of five are an S. Okay, so that's, that's kind of nice because that's sort of like, that's actually what we're looking for, right? So no numbers mod five are an S. 
Now for one mod five, we don't really know. I mean, for seven square, this is 49, right? So I know that for four mod five, whatever the smallest number is, let's say this is X, this is Y, this is Z. We know it's less than or equal to 49, right? So that gives a bound. Um, and then if we like, if we square 49 again, right? Uh, or if we add five and square 49, so we get 54 squared, that is one mod five as well. If you, or that is one mod five, if you do like the, you know, cause four mod five squared is one mod five. So we know that whatever this X is, is less than or equal to 54 squared. But that's obviously not that helpful. Like that's a big number. So, um, and then for three, like we're, we're pretty much lost. Like it, it's, it's not clear, um, you know, cause we can't really, and the way that we've been generating elements, it's not clear that you can get any number just three mod five. So at this point we get stuck. And when you get stuck working forwards, then you start working backwards, right? So at this point we get stuck for a little bit and then we decide to move on and work backwards. Starting from the condition. Now. So, so just like before, we're gonna test cases, right? Cause it's not clear, oh, we have a second viewer. Awesome. <laughs> Um, just like before, we're going to test cases and it, this is a little bit trickier, like the condition, because like I said, we don't really know a lot about, about what's going on, uh, with S. How do I, how do I phrase this? Um, so starting from the condition. Okay. So starting from the condition, we want to know whether particular elements are in S or, or are not in S. Right. So we're going to test cases by by just picking a random number, let's say eight. OK. And the reason I pick eight, I mean, it's sort of random. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, but like we don't know anything about numbers three mod five. So I'm just going to ask the question, is eight an S? Right. I'm going to pick a specific element and I'm going to analyze that question and hope I can uncover some kind of general information. Right. So we ask the question, is eight in S? Okay, well, now we kind of just follow this logically down. So if eight is an S, right, then that, that implies, like, if we think about the sequence of operations from two to eight, right, like going from two all the way to eight, that chain, then that implies, you know, if eight is an S, or eight is an S, if and only if eight squared is an S, because the only way we can get eight is by taking a square root. We can't take a number and you know, eight is not a square number, so we can only get it from this operation, right? So if eight is an S, if and only if, 64 is an S or eight squared. So then we ask the question, okay, well, is, is 64 an S? Is eight squared an S? And here, I mean, so now there's actually two ways that 64 could be an S. The first way is the same thing where we have where eight to the fourth is an S and then so is eight squared and then so is eight. Or because 64 is a square, you know, eight squared, we could also have three in S and three generates 64. But if three, but like, if three was an S, then we, then this, we don't even need to ask this question in the first place. Cause if three was an S then obviously eight would too. Right. So there's kind of two ways 64 can be an S, but one of them sort of like, just we just start the same kind of questioning process again. Because if we ask, is three an S, then we say, well then three is an S only if you know three squared is an S, and we just keep going. So we can ask the question again, is eight to the fourth an S? And we could keep doing this, but hopefully what we notice something very interesting uh, is that well, eight squared is 64, right? So this is, you know, we can also ask, you know, is 64 squared an S? And actually 64 squared is one mod five, right? And we know 54 squared is an S, which is one mod five as well. So the answer is yes, right? So 64 squared is one mod five. And so is 54 squared. So that implies that, you know, we can generate 64 squared by starting from 55, 54 squared and then just adding five. And so the answer to the question, 
is eight in S is yes, eight is in S. Okay, well, so then now let's just kind of like continue this process. So if eight is in S, what about three? Like, can we get, is every number three mod five in S? So now we'll ask is three in S? And we'll do the same exact questioning process. So again, all we're doing is starting from the condition, we're testing a specific case and we're just following it logically down and seeing what it logically implies, right? So now we ask is three in S? And then again, three square, is three squared in S? And then again, is three to the fourth in S, right? Which is um, because you know you can't get three squared from this operation. And then three to the fourth is 81, right? It's one mod five, okay? So we don't really know, but then we can just ask again, right? Like we can just ask is three to the eighth in S? And the answer is, well, three to the eighth is 81 squared which is one mod five and 81 squared is bigger than 54 squared. So indeed three to the eighth is an S. And so is three to the fourth, three squared and that's three. So what we've proven is that all numbers three mod five are in S. And now we want to generalize because what we notice is that pretty much what it seems like, it seems like for any element, right? If we keep squaring it, we always get a number, which is one mod five. We can actually prove that uh, pretty easily. Now you could just test Kate. So there's two ways you could get that result. So actually, wait, let me kind of kind of jumping around a little bit. Um, so at this point, at this point, what we know is that like we, we know that in order to figure out whether an element is in S, we can just repeatedly square it and see if those higher powers are in S as well. So we could do the same for four, for example, and we could discover that four is indeed in S, right? If you do this process and um, uh, one is, that's a different, one is not, I will talk about that later. Um, but hopefully what you kind of notice with this mod situation is that any number which is not, any number which is not a multiple of five and n, n to the fourth will be one mod five. And you can get that from like Fermat's little theorem, or you can just get that from just literally testing all the cases. Okay, there's only four. And so is n to the eighth and n to the 16th, right? n to the 32nd, right? Because um, if we just keep squaring this, it's always one mod five. So the idea is like all of these super high powers of any number that are like, you know, n to the 64th power or something, that's one mod five and it's going to be an S because we know that some smaller number is like, we know that 54 squared, for example, is an S, right? Okay. So now the only question is, um, so let, let's go back to our, let's go back to like our, ch our uh, chart and analyze, you know, whether we fully answer this question. So it's, So regroup. Okay. So now, so for zero mod five, we've already established and we can show pretty easily that there's no multiples of five, just using like a, it's like an, an invariant argument. Like there's no multiples of five that stays invariant the whole time, whatever. There's nothing there. Now for one mod five, we actually don't know the smallest number one mod five that's in S. Um, because we could ask, the, like, we don't know whether one is in S, for example, right? Because when we repeatedly do these powers of one, we don't get the same effect. We don't get the same, like, it won't grow. And so it'll always be one mod five, but like, we can't apply the same argument to one. So we need to analyze that a little bit later. Um, so we'll leave one mod five open. So for two mod five, the smallest element is two. For three mod five, it's three. And for four mod five, it's four, right? And now we're gonna look at this one. So what we notice is, let's, let's say the smallest number, one mod five is N, okay? 
So what must be true is that m minus five. So let me let me take a step back. So um, if m is in s, then m minus five is not right because m is the smallest one by five. So m minus five cannot be an S. So what that means is that m minus five, so if we think about this process, right? m minus five to the fourth power cannot be an S, right? Because, because then if it was, then m minus five would be. But m minus five to the fourth is one mod five. So if it's not an S, then we must have m minus five to the fourth is less than m which is a very stringent condition, if you think about it. Now you can do this algebraically. I, like, I think that actually, if you're trying to just figure this out, you can just test, kind of test stuff around. Um, but like, if you're trying to prove it, I think that this is a good way to go. So given this condition, right? Like M would have to, M equal to, so M equal to one, like, so, how do I say this? Clearly M could be one, like this doesn't really apply to M equals one um, because of this like M minus five is not possible. Uh, but M equal to six also satisfies the condition, right? But M equal to like 11 would not because six to the fourth is not less than 11. So we have, so it's, so either M, equal, M equals one or six, either the smallest element one mod five is one or six. And the way that we can show that it's actually six is that if you think about one, right? So we can, we can I guess, um, we can sort of make the argument like, we can make kind of a similar argument to this zero mod five situation, which is like, if one is not in S, then we can't get one, right? Because like, so if one was already an S, then we, sure, we could get one by this N squared to N operation. But if one isn't there, we can't actually get it, right, from either of these operations, and that's quite easy to show. So to conclude, the numbers which, the, uh, numbers which are not in S are any numbers of the form 5K or the number one. That's the answer the problem. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, like I said, the one mod five thing, I, I think I explained a little bit weird because I was using like algebra stuff. Like if you just test cases, you can get it. You can get it pretty clearly because at that point, like once you get to this final point, you've already basically solved like the entire problem. So you should be able to understand like, you know, what you're doing, hopefully. <laughs> okay, now I will go through some important lessons from this problem. I have to pull up the document. Okay, so I don't know if I want to write these down. No, I'll just go through them because we already kind of went through them in practice. So first is you want to always make sure to keep a big picture view, okay? And you want to maintain direction. I will, I will actually write that down. So big picture view and uh, maintain direction. This is something I went over last time, but it's very important. So I need to reiterate it. Now, when I was doing this and trying to fill out S using cases and stuff, I kind of lost sight of the big picture. Like what is really going on and how do we understand and prove the condition? I was just kind of like generating elements of S just like, you know, trying to see if I could get everything or I, I don't know. And, um, I kind of lost sight of like why I was actually doing that, right? Make sure anything you do in a problem, 
there's like a reason that you're doing it. And there's a reason that you're doing it in the context of the larger problem. Sometimes that reason can just be like, you know, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to like try this out to see if it works. But that's, I mean, that's fine. But you need to clarify that beforehand with yourself so you don't get like super lost in it. Secondly, you want to begin a problem, um, especially if it's hard, by asking kind of like these guiding questions. Now, it sounds like sort of a, a step that's easy to skip. A lot of times you just want to jump in, right? But it's very important that you kind of like state these three things, the three things I went over, like given, like um, understanding the given information, understanding the condition, and sort of the general principle that there should be a solution out there, which is, which is pretty, you know, straightforward. Um, and it seems like something that, like I said, it's something that's easy to skip over, but I would encourage you if you're doing a hard problem, if you have, and like, if you're doing, let's say the USMO, you have like an hour and a half for per problem. Like you can take 30 seconds and write down these three things, right? In depth, uh, you don't need to like to rush. And even on something like the Amy, if you're solving a hard problem on the Amy, you usually give yourself like maybe even 30 or 40 minutes uh, if it's, you know, if it's hard, if it's really hard. So you have time to do this and it will save you a lot of time in the long run. All right. Now, okay, now ask. So I guess, screw it. All right, now. So guiding questions and sort of like guiding principles as well. Now, now, what you also want to do is ask specific questions to expose general structure. Right. That was a big thing that we did in this problem that was vital to solving this problem. Um, and then you want to ask equivalent follow-up questions to guide your process. Right. So you want to ask like a specific question. Like I said, it seems, it seems almost such a basic question to ask is eight an S it seems like, so it seems so basic. Right. But if you just ask that question like explicitly and then you think about it, it is actually, um, helps you out a lot. And it's actually something that people, you, you know, uh, might not actually think to ask explicitly. So like I said, I want to get more to the point. So, ask equivalent follow-up questions. Right, and now, yeah. Okay. So this can often help you better attack at the heart of the issue that you're trying to solve. Don't jump to conclusions. This is something, so wrote that down, All right? Don't jump to conclusions. Again, something I have discussed multiple times, but it is so important, especially for a problem like this, where if you just test cases and test cases and you're like, well, I can't figure out how to generate eight, so I'm just going to assume eight isn't there, right? And then you set out to prove that, you know, like you set out to prove that, for example, like when I was doing this, I set out to prove that no elements three mod five were an S. And so when you do that, you're just totally like off track and it's just terrible because if you make a wrong conjecture and especially if you're confident in it, then not only are you not going to solve the problem, but you're also like straight up wasting time. Right. And you feel stupid <laughs> when you figure out you feel stupid when you, um, you figure out your, your conjecture was wrong and is demoralizing. So it, it hurts like in, in every way possible. So don't jump to conclusions. You want to let your intuition guide you, but you want to treat it with skepticism. Okay. Um, this is like an actual psychology thing. Your intuition, oftentimes it can get the right answer right away. Like a general sense of the right answer of the right direction, but it cannot detect a detail very well. So for example, like, like when you, like when, when you stereotype somebody, um, like when you stereotype somebody, uh, like let's say you have the stereotype that all math majors are big nerds. Okay. Yeah. I mean like that's generally very, very true, but, 
um, and like your intuition is going to be kind of right. But at the same time, your intuition is not going to be very good at detecting detail. Like maybe this math person, I don't know exactly how to go about this. Maybe they're like strong or something like that. Like you would not, your intuition would not be able to detect that very quickly. Um, so that's like a sort of a real world example of what I'm talking about. And a problem, um, you might be able to get the general idea of what the answer is, but I mean, a lot of these problems require a lot of detail. I mean, so you gotta be, you can't miss that detail. So to understand an entire structure like S, you need to kind of have an intuitive understanding of the functionality of like its parts. So I would say like, so to understand like general structure, you wanna have an understanding of the intuitive functionality of the parts. So that was like, when we looked at the operations, they, again, they seem contrived and they kind of are, but um, when we looked at them, we sort of kind of said, okay, two is like the starting seed. This one's like a, a shrinking and this one's an expansion. And, it, and that's actually kind of important to understand how they work and when you should apply them, right? Um, if you just think of them as like just operations, right? Uh, you won't, you won't have very good intuition for how to use them. And uh, this isn't lastly, lastly, but this is so important. Don't underestimate the difficulty of a problem. Don't underestimate difficulty. Now, this is an experience that I think everyone has had. Let's say you're doing like the AMC 10 and you're confident that you can solve the first like 15 problems with ease. Like you're, you're totally above that level and you probably are, or, or like if you think that you, you might be, or you probably are. And then you get to like problem seven and problem seven is giving you a lot of trouble for whatever reason, okay? <laughs> and what happens is you think that this problem should be easy, right? So you don't actually sort of fully turn on your brain for it. You, you, just, you just kind of try something that's very naive or simple or, or bashy. And then when you can't solve it, you get frustrated with yourself, right? So not only are you at primed to sort of approach it, uh, approach it like it's easy and uh, approach it kind of naively, you also are dealing with the frustration that you can't solve it. And so that kind of blocks you from being creative as well. So never underestimate the difficulty of a problem. It's always important to remember like certain problems, you just won't see the insight right away and certain problems you will. Like, we, you, I mean, everyone also, I think has had the experience where there's a problem that's much later in a test that they think they shouldn't be able to solve, but they actually just figure out the solution right away. So my issue was when I solved this a couple months ago, I was like, oh, this is an A1. I mean, it's still hard, but it's an A1. I should be able to solve an A1. And so I approached it um, not very carefully, right? I didn't approach it very carefully. And um, I got, you know, sort of stuck, uh, stuck like in a hole in the problem. All right, how do I say that? Kind of like got tunnel visioned, kind of buried myself in a hole and couldn't really get out. And actually, this is something that's very interesting because, you know, what makes the Putnam very hard, uh, you know, it's not only the, the difficulty, the inherent sort of intrinsic difficulty of the problems, but what also makes the Putnam very hard is it's the, the self-doubt that comes when you're solving them. Because like I said, the, uh, I said at some point, the Putnam is taken by like, you know, arguably the best math students in America, like 5,000 of them. And the median score out of 120 is usually one or zero out of 120 points. And so most people, like even to get top 500, to get top 500, you're using to solve like maybe, maybe like three problems. If you solve three problems fully, or you get like at least like eight out of 10 points on them, you're in the top 10% of a group of students who's already like really good at math. So 
what makes the Putnam really hard is that there's so much self doubt that comes when you're solving the problems and it's hard to stay focused on the problem itself instead of like the anxiety that you attach with it. Right. Um, so it's not only like math difficult, it's psychologically difficult. And lastly, important questions when you're reviewing, I laid out this like eight, I laid out this long review process. Um, and I think it's useful, but I think if you want to be efficient, when you're reviewing, you need to ask two important questions. The first is, if you got it, if you didn't solve it right, what went wrong? Even if you did solve it, what went wrong? Okay. And the second is, Given I were seeing that, this is really important. Given I were seeing this with fresh eyes, how could I approach the problem difficult or differently to reach the solution? So I will say this is like, so given fresh eyes, how can I change my approach? This one is super hard. I mean, both are hard. And the reason is, that after you look at the solution to a problem, you have like, you know, it's very hard to put yourself in the shoes of your past self when you didn't know the solution. So it's easy to say what went wrong. Like um, it's, or with these questions, you have to look at it from the viewpoint of the, of the person who was solving them, right? Not the person who already knows the solution. So like for this, for the second question, given you have fresh eyes, that is a very hard thing to do, right? And that requires practice, but it's so important because I think a lot of times when you're reviewing a problem, or a lot of people, when they're reviewing a problem, they forget that they didn't know the solution when they were actually solving it. And so they think, oh yeah, next time I'll just, like, that makes sense. I'll just think to do that. But they don't think about like, like, I guess how they could actually reach that given fresh eyes, right? So this is super important. These are the two very important questions um, that you need to ask and review. And you need to think very deeply about them because they're very hard. Uh, as an example for, so for example, for what went wrong, there was one problem I didn't solve, right? And I, when I was asking the question, what went wrong? I sort of, the, the path I took was not any of, was not like the right path, okay? And when I was asking the question, what went wrong? I actually realized I didn't really do anything wrong. Like the given sort of the pattern that I noticed, the path that I took was actually very logical, even though I didn't reach the solution. So, which is, which is sort of a weird thing to think about, but um, it's a really important kind of mindset to put yourself in when you're reviewing. Okay. Whew. All right. I know I said we're doing two problems, so. <laughs> We will do the second problem. Uh, this one hopefully will be, um, you know, a little bit shorter. Or I'll, I'll try to be a little bit, a little bit quicker with it. Now, I personally thought this problem was very interesting, and um, the problem basically goes like this: so you have a function which is defined by a power series, an infinite power series, and each of the coefficients of the terms is either zero or one, so it's just a bunch of sums of x to powers, okay? And you're given the condition that f of two thirds equals three halves. So let me, let me, just, let me just write this down. Write this down. <sighs> ci x to the i, where ci is zero or one. f of two thirds is equal to three halves. And f of, you want to prove, oh shoot, so you want to show f of one half is irrational. Okay, this problem kind of intrigued me the first time I looked at it. And I think it had, it's a very nice one. Now, okay, so again, you have those three important things to remember uh, when you're starting a problem. First is working forwards. The second is working backwards. And the third is this idea that you're looking for key insights, right? 
you're looking for kind of, uh, you're not just looking to bash things out, okay? And I also sort of, when I was solving this, I actually feel, one of the reasons I like this problem too is because when I solved it, I solved it in a very, like, I like the way that I approached it. Um, so the first thing I did was kind of write an intuitive thought that I had at first for why this condition is the case, right? So I basically, so I said, because, because this infinite series sort of aligns so well for two thirds, F of two thirds is a rational number. It makes sense that it would not align for a very different fraction, X equals one half. So the idea is for most rational, this is an infinite power series. So for most rational numbers you plug in, it's not going to be rational, right? It's just gonna be some random irrational number. The fact that it's so nice for two thirds sort of means uh, like somehow that it wouldn't be nice like that for one half, which is a different kind of a, a pretty different fraction. Again, this is very nebulous statement, but that's kind of the point because then I can kind of pick it apart. But that's that's sort of the general idea. So here, let me pull up the, um, I have a document where I reviewed this. Okay, yeah. All right. So the first thing I did was work forwards. I tried to figure out, given this condition, what does that imply about the coefficients of f of x? First thing you can notice is that what if what if all of the coefficients were just one, right? So that would be, you know, f of that would just f of two thirds just be one plus two thirds plus two thirds squared, just the geometric series. And that's gonna be equal to one over, right? Yeah, okay. One over one minus two thirds, which is three. Okay. So, um, uh, so something like you can notice is if you, if we, if we make too many of these first terms have C equal to zero, like if we don't, if we make some of these first terms go away, then we won't be able to reach three halves. So like if we let, um, uh, these first two terms, like they didn't, they weren't in the sum, like they were, their coefficients were zero, then the maximum value of this sum would be three minus five thirds, which is four thirds, right? So we know that like, it's okay if we had, for example, it's okay if C zero was zero, because then this would just equal two, right? So let me just revise this. But if C zero is zero, then C1 must be one, okay? So that's like an example restriction that we know must be the case. Something I also noticed was, and this isn't actually super important, but I think it helped, was that you have F of two thirds equals three halves. I noticed that they were reciprocals of each other. So I noticed that for two thirds, we had F of X equal to one over X, which implies that X F of X is equal to one which means that, so if we think about this function here, x f of x, all that's doing is just like it's a power series and we don't allow one to be in a, like x to the zero to be in that power series. And I thought this was much nicer because what we have is basically a sum of two powers of two thirds where we can't use the number one, right? And that sum equals one instead of three halves, okay? That seems nicer, so I, I went with that. And actually, I mean, and also another reason that's useful is because if, you know, and we, if we define this as g of x, if g of a half is irrational, then g of a half, then f of a half is irrational, right? All we're doing is multiplying by x, so that's, you know, or one half, so we're not actually affecting the rationality of anything. Okay, this is definitely true. So my second intuitive thought was that in this sum of two thirds, uh, there, ex there are certain restrictions on the existence of earlier terms since the later terms are gonna aggregate something you know, too small, something smaller. So when, when I wrote this out, I realized, you know, I said there are certain restrictions. So, what's, so the question is, what specifically? What are those restrictions specifically? 
And I will cut you the time. I will cut you the effort. Basically, I went through and analyzed, you know, did a little bit of casework just to see if, you know, we could get any kind of like recurrent, like recurrence or, you know, uncover anything more. And I didn't end up doing that. So I, I, I did that for a little bit, but um, I got stuck. And importantly, once I got stuck, I uh, decided to go back and, you know, kind of go back to the beginning. Right. And what I said was, well, this whole time we worked forward. So, you know, discussing the implications of the given information. So now let's work backward and try to figure out what are the implications of the condition? What are the implications of f of one half being irrational? Now, I thought this was very weird at first because the only way that I remembered to prove that a number was irrational, like if you want to prove the square root of two is irrational, you set it equal to a rational number and then you like, you know, you just kind of set it equal to a rational number and you kind of uh, do, do some algebra. I'm not gonna explain it. Like I think, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it seemed weird to me, like how else do I prove that a number is irrational? It seemed weird. Now something that's different about one half compared to two thirds, but the, the series is that if I think about summing like one half plus one half squared plus, you know, all of those, that's equal to one. It's very famously known. But what's different about this compared to two thirds is that like, let's say I want this sum to equal um, three fourths, or that's a bad example. I'll say, um, five six. So I don't have the same freedom as I do here uh, with uh, two thirds because if the sum equals five six, I can't just say I can't just ignore the one half. I can't say okay, well I'm not going to include the one half even though I can because these terms all sum to one half. Like that's the feature of the sort of sum of powers of one half is that all of the terms afterwards sum to the previous term. So if, if, you know, I have this sum to be true, then I can't just exclude this term here because then this will just be a half. In the previous example, I had a bit of freedom because all of the sums of the two thirds, like the two third powers, they could sum to something larger than the previous term, right? So there's actually, given that f of one half equals a specific number, right? If I was given that constraint, there's actually only one choice of CI that will work, right? Um, I have no freedom. I just have to pick, you know, if I can pick it, then I have to pick it. Um, and that's, and that's sort of a, an important distinction. So sort of the selection process for CI is different for one half and for two thirds. So now after realizing that, there's something, um, I, uh, I don't exactly know how to explain how I noticed this, but I think that it kind of arose from this analysis, but this is a very important key insight, which is that F of one half actually represents, so what I noticed was, okay, well, every rational number has a unique representation like of CI. And so I thought like, where else does that come up? And what you eventually notice is that f of one half is actually, so like in what other system is every number only representable in like, in like one combination of, of numbers? And I realize f of one half is actually um, binary. It's actually the coefficients in binary. So f of one half equals zero point c1, c2, c3, c4, dot, 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 in binary. And this was, this is a big deal. And the reason is that if we have, so if we want to know if this number is rational or not, if we think in base 10, in base 10, a number is rational if and only if its expansion, either like its decimal expansion, either terminates or it has a periodic element, right? And uh, you can, I didn't prove that. I think uh, that's safe to not prove. And the same is true in base two. The same is true in any base. Uh, you know, I mean, base, there's nothing special about base 10. 
And so this is sort of like a very important realization is that f of one half is the sequence of CIs in binary. So now what I did is, so again, I was, this is working backwards. So then I worked forwards again and I thought, so somehow, somehow, if somehow we cannot have a periodic group or terminating group of, or like somehow, there, I mean, there's two cases, terminating and periodic. Periodic is clearly like, seems a little bit harder, but somehow we can't have the CIs have that kind of pattern given F of two thirds equals three halves. So if F of two thirds equals three halves, we cannot have this repeating block of, of CIs, right? Somehow, somehow. And now what we want to think of is, is why, why is that the case? Why is it that any repeating set of elements would kind of screw, screw things up? So first we'll do terminating because it's the easier case. Although granted like terminating, you can think of as periodic, just like your zeros, but um, it's easier to just treat terminating like terminating. So let's say we had some, you know, a certain sum of two powers of two thirds. So I don't exactly know, you know, what it is. And it's finite. Okay, and it equals one. Remember, we're using we're using a g of x in this case. Now, what we notice is this fraction here on the left side. We can write this as a fraction with a denominator of three to the n, right? We can if we just simplify it, and sort of like for this, you know, for uh, um, so this here has a denominator of three to the n. I'm not sure how I explain this actually. Basically, if you're adding two fractions and they equal one, that only happens in a few cases. You're only able to do that in a few cases. So for example, if I add like two fifths and three sevenths, it can't equal one. And the reason I know that is just because like, like intuitively you can know that is because like a fifth and a seventh, they're two completely different fractions. So it doesn't make sense that they just like fit together nicely. You know what I mean? And the only cases in which you can have fractions, quote unquote, fit together nicely is if you had something like, well, A, they both have the same denominator, right? Or B, um, they have like a, um, the denominator, one of the denominators is like a multiple of the other. So like one half plus, I guess, and they have to be simplified, right? So if you had like a half plus a third plus a sixth, that equals one. And that's allowed because two and three divide into six, right? You can kind of get this if you just test stuff around. And you think about why is that the case, right? So let's think if A over B plus C over D equals one, we're gonna kind of prove this statement. What we can realize is that if we multiply both sides by B, right? Let me write that bigger. So A over B plus C over D equals one. If we multiply both sides by B, we get A plus B C over D equals B. But importantly, these two are integers and this is not, or at least we're assuming this is not, right? This is just a, a fraction. This, is, this needs to be an integer, B C over D. And it's only the case if, you know, D divides, um, if D divides into B, because we know that, uh, for example, C over D, this is fully simplified, okay? So we know that D and C share no common factors, so D must divide into B. All right, now let's go back to this one. Um, so that's sort of like a lemma that we have. And so what we, we think is, um, you know, Dang, how do I, I'm not gonna explain this. So this is actually a little bit more difficult than I expected, uh, the terminating case. Okay, here's an easy way, here's an easy way to do this, right? Is if you think about it, the numerator of this sum is always even, right? Because it always has a two. So the numerator of this sum is even, but the denominator would be three to the n if we simplified it. 
So even numerator, odd denominator can't equal one. So that deals with the terminating case real easily. So even denominator over odd, or even numerator over odd denominator cannot equal one. The reason I did that discussion with the fractions is because that comes up in the periodic case. So terminating, so terminating case we have fully dealt with. You cannot have terminating, um, you know, coefficients. Now let's look at periodic. So what we want to do is we want to sum all of the non-periodic elements and then the periodic, all the periodic blocks, right? So let's say we have some periodic block, which is, um, so I did, when I solved this problem, I did it very algebraically, which was a bit of a mistake, but it's not a big deal. Um, so let's say you have some periodic block CI, CI plus one up to CJ where, or no, yeah, where J is equal to I plus the period minus one. Okay, so this is our repeating uh, block. And this is the first instance of that repeating block. Now, if we sum all of the non-periodic terms, right, then we get some fraction with denominator three to the n, three to the something. But if we look at the sum of, so that would be, you know, some fraction, which I'll just say is like Q over three to the K, right? And then the next um, sort of, uh, so this is like Q over three to the K. And then the sum of the periodic terms is going to have a different denominator. So if we say, um, let's say like we can simplify this periodic block to R over three to the J. Right, so like c to the j has a denominator three to the j. We can we can simplify this as r to over three to the j, and then we multiply that by one, right? Because that's the the pure, the value of the periodic block, and then every periodic block after is going to be sort of is going to be two thirds to the p smaller, right? Because everything's going to be shifted over p. So one plus two thirds to the p plus two thirds to the two p, and that continues on. And this, and this here, right, this geometric series is going to be one over one minus two thirds to the P, uh, which I believe if you simplify is going to be um, three to the P minus, so it's gonna be three to the P over three to the P minus two to the P. Not, the, the, the values are not super important. What's important to recognize is that we're summing two fractions, right? So Q over three to the K and R over three to J times three to the P over three to the P minus two to the P, whatever. But they have two, both these denominators, three to the J times three to the P minus two to the P and three to the K, they are not multiples of each other, right? I mean, clearly um, uh, they can't be, right? So like, uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, wait, I mean, so let's, let's see, like I said, I did this algebraically at first and it was kind of a mistake, but that's part of the process. So three to the K and three to the J times three to the P minus two to the P. So I guess, I suppose this could, three to the K could divide into this if K was less than J. Let me look at, let me look at, uh, I apologize. Let me look at me reviewing this problem. Oh, I think there's a simple fix. Um, So, I mean, if we follow this algebra down, then we would need K to be less than J, which is definitely true. Damn. Uh, 
Okay. Um, let me regroup a bit. It's okay. This is part of the process. This is part of the process. So what we would have is, um, um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and I'll come back to it later. I remember, but basically, if you I, so what we have is a fraction. Okay, so we need to have q over. Th I'm just gonna go through the algebra. Q over three to the k plus r over three to the j times three to the p minus two to the p needs to equal one. Okay, and so if we were to, oh, okay, I, I, I see how to do this, I see how to do this. So if we were to multiply both sides by three to the K, right, then we get Q plus three to the K R over three to the J times three to the P minus two to the P equals three to the K. Importantly, this must be an integer, right? And for that to be an integer, we need three to the J times three to the P minus two to P to divide into three to the K. Okay. But so we need three to the J times three to the P minus two to the P to divide into three to the K. But um, so this can only be happen if P is one, right? Because if P was like two, then this would be five, right? This would, P equal to one, like if this is, um, if P is not one, this is some number which is greater than one, which is not divisible by three. And that, that can't be the case because it divides into three to the K. So this implies P must be one, okay? So the period must be one and that J is, so P equal to one, and J is less than or equal to K, all right? So the problem here is that we can't have J less than or equal to K because the way we defined it, right? K starts before the periodic element. So K is less than J, right? And so this is like a contradiction and we've proven the statement. Whew. Again, I'm sorry that I did not prepare better for that. But um, heavily algebraic solution, uh, but you can, um, that's the main idea. All right, I'm just gonna move on. Thank you, uh, the, whoever the one person, thank you for sticking, sticking with me through this, um, unless it's changed, that one person has changed. Okay, so once you see the solution, right? Um, once, so once you see the solution, you want to stop and ask whether a simplifi simplification of logic can save you time. Um, often it'll be right in front of you. And this is especially true in when you're writing up a problem. So like what I mean is you'll kind of see like the key insight, like sometimes you'll see the key insight, um, and you'll just like be, you'll just dive in. But you need, to, whenever you see the key insight, that's the point where you need to stop and ask yourself whether you can, you can, um, you know, push it further and simplify, simplify what you're thinking uh, so you can get to the solution more quickly. And this is true if you're doing the Putnam, this is especially true before you write up the problem. Because a lot of times if your solution is really long winded, the write up is going to take a long time. And that's actually, uh, you know, I mean, you don't have, you don't, you have three hours, but you don't, you don't have that much time. You can't be spending like 45 minutes on the write-up. And so um, often this kind of simplification will be right in front of you. Yeah, so just be disciplined and be patient, uh, especially once you, you see the solution, you see the light at the end of the tunnel, be patient. Um, because if you rush, you will end up wasting more time than if you just took it slow. And when you notice um, a contradiction so this is, this is a problem I had. When you notice a contradiction, precisely state it, okay? Do not focus yet on, on some kind of auxiliary statement which can help show the contradiction. Focus on the contradiction itself. Um, 
so what I mean is when I was solving this problem and I saw the key insight that the denominators do not line up correctly, I assumed that um, the condition was that the two denominators had to be relatively prime, right? Or, or sorry, um, that if the two denominators were relatively prime then they could not sum to one, right? Those two fractions. But it actually, it's a much more stringent condition is that one of the denominators has to sort of like be a multiple of the other or divide into the other or something like that. And so when I note, I noticed the contradiction that the two denominators did not like add correctly. And then I focused too heavily right away on an auxiliary statement, because it's certainly true that if two denominators are relatively prime, certainly they cannot add to one, but that's actually not the contradiction itself. Right. I was trying to prove that the two denominators, denominators were relatively prime instead of the actual statement. So, like I said, that came from when I first solved the problem um, or when I first made that kind of realization, I rushed and I focused too heavily on proving an auxiliary statement, which was actually like made my life way harder. So whenever you make sort of some kind of breakthrough, some kind of discovery, you need to be patient and relax with yourself. <sighs> okay. Hopefully that was useful and interesting. Um, I got stuck, but that's okay. Sometimes you get stuck. So like I said, the AMC 10 and 12 are coming up. And so I might just review those for, for, for you know, just for fun. They won't be much help for Putnam problems. Um, that's for sure. <clears throat> and yeah, so stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for coming.